Hi there. My name is Aaron Landerman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech. And in the last lecture of EC 3400 Analog Electronics, we looked at the voltage gain transfer function of an op amp in an inverting amplifier configuration when the underlying op amp had frequency dependent gain. And in this lecture, I would like to take a look at the input impedance of such a circuit. But before we talk about the non-ideal case, let's talk about the ideal case. So if we assume that we have infinite gain over the infinite range of frequencies, then the negative feedback results in the voltage at the positive terminal, which here is ground, being copied at the negative terminal. So from the point of view of the voltage source driving the circuit, it just sees a resistance R1 to ground, and it doesn't know about what's happening to the right of the line I just drew. So in this case, the input impedance is just R1, and you could do this without any detailed circuit analysis. Now, a more realistic op -amp model would presume that the gain is both frequency dependent and not infinite. And as in the previous couple of lectures, we're going to assume that we can use a first order low pass model for the frequency response. So I'm letting capital A here represent our frequency response represented in the Laplace domain. So if you plug J omega in for S, you get the frequency response. Now, this is the way Marshall Leach usually writes it in his notes. I often like to multiply the numerator and the denominator by omega naught to write it in this form, but you can use whatever form you like. Now, I'm still going to assume that we have infinite input impedance on the original op amp, so no current is flowing through the inputs. And I'm also going to assume that we have zero output impedance, so our voltage output is a perfect voltage source. You can tweak our analysis to include these effects, and you wind up with a more complicated analysis and more complicated formulas. But I don't think the resulting formulas are that illuminating, so I won't get into that kind of analysis here. Now, to compute the input impedance, I need to either set up an independent voltage source and measure the current I1, or I could set up an independent current source and measure the voltage VI. But I already have the circuit set up so that we're thinking about VI being a perfect voltage source here. So let's go with that. And so we'll set VI and compute I1. And then we can compute our input impedance as just VI over I1. All right. So what is I1? So I1 by Ohm's law is going to be VI minus the voltage at the negative terminal divided by R1. Let me multiply the numerator and the denominator of this expression by R1. So I get rid of the R1 and the denominator, and I wind up with an R1 on top. And I'm also going to divide the numerator and the denominator by VI. So the VI will disappear here and disappear here, and this V minus will wind up with a VI like you see here. Now I'm going to do something that seems unmotivated. I'm going to put a VO here and a VO here. So I haven't actually changed the expression any. These VOs cancel out. But why did I take this simple looking expression and turn it into something that's more complicated? Well, I have an expression for VO over VI, and I have an expression for V minus over VO. So let's play with that a little bit. Our output is going to be equal to our transfer function A for the original op amp times the voltage at the positive terminal minus the voltage at the negative terminal. Now, the voltage at the positive terminal is zero, so this goes away. And notice now I could divide both sides of the expression here by VO. So if I do that, this goes away here. And now I can also divide both sides of the expression by AS. So when I do that, this goes away. And let me put a 1 up here in the numerator here. And let's see, if I wanted to know what V minus over VO is, well, let me take this and turn it into a plus, and I'll turn this into a minus. So I can take this V minus over VO term and replace it with 1 over minus AS. Now let's also consider VO over VI. So that was the big complicated derivation we did in the last lecture. So if you go check out the last lecture, 
you'll find that one of our expressions for VO over VI looks like this. And let's see, this negative here will cancel with that negative there. I can take this AS and multiply it through. So when I do that, this AS will go away and I'll wind up with an AS in this spot here. So I wind up with something that looks like this. All right, so let's take this expression, copy it onto the next slide, and let's see, I would like to clear out this R1 and this R1. So let's take the numerator and the denominator of this subfraction and multiply each of those by R1. So I wind up with an RF in the numerator here, the R1 goes away, the A term winds up with an R next to it, and when I multiply this term here by R, I wind up with an R1 in the one spot, and where I had RF over R1, I now have just RF. All right, so I think that's a little simpler. Okay, now I'm just going to rewrite it slightly. RF is hanging out here, but all of the R1 terms, what I'm going to do is I'm going to group those together. And so I can write R1 times A plus 1. So that's just factoring out R1. All right, so let's take that expression and play around with it a little bit more. Let's see, this stuff here, this R1 times A plus 1 plus RF, I need to call that something. So media composer and Spitfire audio owner Christian Henson, who is one of my favorite YouTubers, likes to call things Dave for some reason. So in the honor of Christian, I'm going to call this Dave. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply the numerator and the denominator by Dave. All right, so I have the original R1 in the numerator, but now I have a copy of Dave in the numerator. This one here gets replaced with Dave. And then when I multiply through by Dave, the original Dave and the new Dave cancel, and I'm left with this RF here. And the reason I went through all that stuff with Dave is that this RF now cancels with this RF. And once those RFs cancel, then I can cancel these R1s, and our expression reduces to this. And it's just kind of nice having this A plus 1 here and this A plus 1 here. Doesn't that look nice? I think it looks nice. But we can make it look even nicer because we can split up these terms. So the second term is RF over A plus 1. And as far as our first term goes, well, this A plus 1 cancels with this A plus 1. So I'm just left with R1. Now, to make any further progress, we need to go ahead and substitute in an explicit expression for A. So that's our A naught over 1 plus S over omega naught. So now I'm going to do something that will feel a little unmotivated at first, but it will make sense once you see the context. So I'm going to take the numerator and the denominator of this expression and divide them both by RF. So the RF in the numerator goes away, and I wind up with an RF here and an RF here. I'm also going to take this subfraction and divide the numerator and the denominator of that subfraction by a naught. So this A0 goes away, and I wind up with an A0 down here. Now, why did I do such a silly thing? So this 1 over 1 over stuff plus 1 over stuff form should look a little familiar. This is the expression for combining parallel impedances. So here's one impedance, and here's another impedance. And this whole thing is these two impedances in parallel. So let me define a resistance R2 as RF over A0. So that corresponds with this spot here. Now, S corresponds to an inductance. So let me define an inductance L as RF over A0 times omega0. So that corresponds with this here. So I can rewrite our impedance as R1 plus 1 over 1 plus R2 plus LS plus 1 over RF. And this expression lets me express our input impedance as an equivalent circuit. So I have R1 in series with a parallel combination of RF, that's this here, with R2 plus LS. So that's a series combination of R2 
and this inductance L. Let's think about some limiting cases. First of all, notice that as A0 goes to infinity, our inductance goes to R1. So I can see that in the equation by saying that as A0 goes to infinity, this term here goes to zero, and as that term goes to zero, this term would go to infinity, so this term will go to zero. It's like Russian nesting doll equations, Matryoshka, I think they're called. So you wind up with R1. But you can also see this by looking at the circuit. As A0 goes to infinity, R2 goes to zero, so this shorts out, and L goes to zero, so this shorts out. So basically RF is shorted out, and you're just left with R1. Okay, now let's forget about letting A0 go to infinity and just think about what the impedance looks like at a frequency of zero and as the frequency goes off to infinity. So if I plug in J0 for S, I wind up with this term here going away. And then I can take this subfraction here and multiply its numerator and denominator by A0. So the A0 goes up here. And then I can multiply the numerator and the denominator of the main fraction by RF. So the RFs here go away, and I wind up with an RF here, which gives me this expression here. Now, if on the other hand I were to plug in J omega for S and let omega goes to infinity, then this here winds up going to zero, and then this goes away, and I can multiply the numerator and the denominator by RF here. So this goes away, and I wind up with an RF in the numerator there, so I wind up with R1 plus RF. So that tells us that this impedance is going to have a Bode plot that looks like a high shelf. Recall a previous lecture in which we discussed a cool theorem that lets you find the formula for the impedance of a circuit in a form that's amenable for making Bode plots. We discussed that theorem in the context of RC circuits, but conveniently it also works for RL circuits where you have one inductor and however many resistors. So RDC is the impedance at DC, and if I wanted to compute that from the schematic, I could say, okay, well at DC the inductor is going to look like a short, so I would have R1 in series with RF in parallel with R2. Now, spelling out the parallel combination explicitly, I have something like this, and I can take my expression for R2 and plug it in here. And if I do that, a bunch of the RFs cancel, and then I can multiply the numerator and the denominator of that fraction by A0 to write RF over A0 plus one. Then I, of course, have this R1 in front. And this is the same expression we got on the previous slide from analyzing this formula here. So that was all basically just a sanity check. Okay, so let's talk about the time constants. Now in RC circuits, we have time constants of the form RC. In our L circuits, the time constants take the form L over R. Now the overall approach of the theorem is the same. We're going to imagine using a couple of wire clippers and clipping out the inductor and replacing it with an ohmmeter to see the resistance looking out from the terminals of the inductor. Now, to compute the time constant associated with the zero, we essentially leave the edge here open. So when I use my clippers here, basically R1 is dangling, so it might as well not be in the circuit. So I'll see R2 in series with RF to this ground and back to the other side of the inductor. So I'll have R2 plus RF in the denominator, and I need to remember to multiply by L. Now for the zero, that's a little bit more complicated. I need to short the ends of the impedance I'm analyzing. So I'll basically short this to the grounds here. All right, so now if I look out from the inductor, I'll have a formula that's basically the same, except now RF is going to appear in parallel with R1. Now, to make a Bode plot, it's convenient to think about this expression in terms of corner frequencies. So I'm going to take our time constants and invert them in order to write something like a pole frequency that's R2 plus RF over L, 
and our zero frequency is going to be R2 plus RF in parallel with R1 over L. So that's just the reciprocal of the time constants. And I'm just rewriting the formula up here in terms of these corner frequencies. Now remember, R2 and L aren't real. They're just part of this model that we made up. So if I substitute in our definitions of R2 and L, I can write something like this. And let's see. Oh, this is nice. The RFs all wind up canceling. And let's see, I can multiply the numerator and the denominator by omega naught. So I'll wind up with an omega naught here. And let's see, I can also multiply the numerator and the denominator by a naught. So the a naughts will go away here, and I wind up with an a naught here. So that should look like this. So that's a nice compact expression. And let's see, I can make the same substitutions for R2 and L for the zero frequency. And here I'm going to explicitly spell out this parallel combination. And basically a lot of the same transformations can take place. So I can multiply the numerator and the denominator by a naught. So I'll wind up with an a naught here. This RF and this RF cancel with this RF. I can multiply the numerator and the denominator by omega naught. And that all should give me something that looks like this. So it's a similar sort of expression, except I have this R1 over RF plus R1 factor here. So these are the corner frequencies for a Bode plot. And that Bode plot is going to have a high shelf kind of form. So at DC, it starts at R1 plus RF over A0 plus 1. And this A0 plus 1 means that the impedance at DC is less than the impedance at infinity, which is R1 plus RF. And also, if I look at the formulas here, it's obvious that omega Z is less than omega P. So this has this high shelf kind of form. So on this kind of impedance plot, we're imagining that the current is the input and the voltage is the output. OK, so big picture. If we have a perfect op amp, the ground here gets copied to the negative terminal and the input impedance is just R1. But if the op amp isn't perfect in terms of not having a perfect voltage transfer function, and in particular, if it has a frequency response specified by this transfer function where you can get the frequency response if you plug J omega in for S, then from the point of view of some circuit that is trying to feed this amplifier fragment we have here, it looks like it's feeding this combination of resistances and an inductor. I find that to be deeply strange. This is not something I would have necessarily expected. If you have any insights on how to think about this, please leave a comment below. If you have any idea of how we might look at this circuit and look at this transfer function and predict that it would have this kind of form, please let me know. If you have any thoughts about the practical consequences of the input impedance of the circuit looking like this, please let me know. I don't really have particularly good intuition about this, and I would like to change that.